She left the web. She left the loom. She made three paces through the room. She saw the water lily bloom. She saw the helmet and the plume. Anyone remember that? That's the BBC warm up from the 1930s that contains every sound in the English language. Is it nudge stuck or is it nudge stuck? I am so happy to be here. Thank you for listening to me and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. I often introduce myself as a refugee from the world of the university. That some 35 years ago, I used to teach in a doctoral program in environmental psychology or the effect that space has on people's behavior. I taught field work and I came up with a way of using a motion picture camera to measure how people move in interior spaces. I coupled it with a practice of obser observation and started knocking on doors. I thought I could work on retail and banking. I'd never taken a retail course in my life, never taken a business course, never taken a marketing course, but I knew a lot about understanding how people move. My first job was working for City Citibank, looking at the first installation of ATMs, and that was in 1977. Part of what was interesting back then is recognizing that as I stepped off into the world of commercial research, there were two systems that people used. First was borrowing the tools of media research and asking people questions. You can do it quantitatively, you can do it qualitatively, you can do it in a focus group, you can do it in person, you can do it online. But one of the things that I know is that what people say they do and what people actually do are often different. The other two old people used is sales research. I called it the myopic view of the functionality of the space, whether real or cyber, from the vantage point of the cash register. It's a way of understanding where you're winning. But all of us in the broader world of retail and of marketing and of advertising, recognize that while it's important to understand where you're winning, some of the easiest and most important victories you can win is understanding where you're losing. What is the difference, whether it's in a real space or a cyberspace versus one of your familiar customer's behavior versus somebody who's coming in for the first time? Before long, we expanded. Part of what was interesting is that in the latter half of the 20th century, while lots of business schools, McKinsey's, the BCG's of the world were talking about strategy, part of what we got to was tactics, meaning that we could walk into almost any retail space or any cyber cyberspace and start to make some immediate, in some cases, very minor changes where you could see the results almost immediately. Part of what is interesting in our broader world of retail and of consumption is that while there are a set of biological constants, those biological constants may be 90% of us are right-handed. Our eyes adjust to changing light based on our age. The way I see color at my age and the way someone sees color at 20 are predictably different. There are some gender issues. There are some generational issues. But part of what is interesting also about retail and consumption is that they are a reflection of the changes in us. That if I look at what, what made a good store in 2000 and what makes a good store in 2022, there are some radical differences there and they are a reflection of the evolution of us. We tested prototype stores in 50 countries across the world. If you think of the Fortune 100 list, we work for more than a third of them. And that work took us everywhere. And part of what was interesting is understanding a series of consumer trends across the globe. Part of what we know is in our post-pandemic world, there are five things 
that were happening before the pandemic hit. And in our post-pan world, those things have either accelerated or morphed. First is the evolution of our relationship to screens. The connection between our eyes and our brains is affected by our exposure to our phones, our exposure to our laptops, our exposure to digital screens in the context of whatever space that we're in. And that part of the irony of our world is that if I go to the design studios, whether they're at Ogilvy in London, or they're in New York, or they're in Tokyo, or they're in Beijing, the person sitting at the CAD CAM screen doing the design work is generally under age 30. And if you're Abercrombie and Fitch, that's fine. But if you're Tesco or you're Mars or you're Selfridges, understanding the difference between how someone sees at 22 and the way someone sees at 60 is a really important issue. How do we see and how do we process what we see? And in our post-pan world where some of us got locked up at home, whatever, this is in a remarkable state of evolution. That's one. Second issue here, the most seminal event in the history of our species since we tamed fire is birth control. Part of what that has done is change the relationship between procreation and sex. And it's changed what the role of gender is in the context of our own lives. Is there a glass ceiling? The answer is yes. Are there issues that are categorically unfair to females? The answer is unequivocally, yes. On the other hand, particularly in retail and in advertising, we often live in a world that's owned by men, designed by men, managed by men, and yet women are more our most important customers. How do we look at our world? whether it's a cyber world or a physical world, through feminist glasses. Part of what we know, for example, here in North America, with each passing month, the number of households where the woman is the dominant bread earner goes up with each passing month. If I look at institutions of higher learning, the graduation rate for females versus males is often very different. There are professions that 50 years ago were totally dominated by men, and yet today, for example, pharmacies. Back in the 1920s, there were no female pharmacists. Today, if you walk into virtually any drugstore anywhere in the Western world, the pharmacist is often female. How do we understand the impact of women? How do we understand their issues of security? And the fact that when they move through a commercial space, what they look at and how they look at is often very different from guys. What makes the world female friendly? And that issue is something that is going to be with us forever and ever. Praise the Lord. Third issue is the role time. Almost all of us are struggling with multitasking issues, particularly in a post post band world. Again, I can go back to the example of a female who is having a job, looking after her kids, trying to deal with school issues, trying to deal with the home, and also trying to do some of her shopping. How do we understand that? And you know, I can stand at a doorway of a Tesco or an Asda and watch somebody walking in the door and I can almost imagine how loud that clock is ticking inside their heads. For every time that you walk into a store ready to spend some time browsing and buying, there's another time you walk in desperate to get in and out. And that's true not only of physical spaces, but of cyber spaces too. How do we understand the role of time in our selection process? And in our post-pan world, time is morphing. That clock ticking inside our heads ticks at a relative degree of loudness. Fourth issue is what is global and what is local? The way someone shops in Macclesfield versus the way someone shops in East London versus 
if I'm a technology company and I'm selling the same software, but the difference between the mindset and the knowledge base of someone walking into my store in Dubai versus my store in Albany, New York, or in Leeds, England, is often different. And it doesn't mean that there's an infinite degree of differences, but it does mean that one of the keys to our world, whether it's advertising, design, management, retail, cyber, whatever, is understanding what the role of local is. We know that historically retail is about birth, life, death, and compost. And we're at a point where there's a certain degree of compost. There is change in the, in the mix. That if the 20th century was about letting us get bigger, think about the global food giants that Ogilvy works for. The interesting issue is that in the 21st century, technology is also letting us get smaller and it's letting us get more local. Do you know, for example, in the 1950s, the family farm was dead. The family farm was dead. Today, thanks to solar power, greenhouses, and the ability to go direct to a customer and not through a wholesaler, the small family farm in parts of the world is doing just fine. In fact, I was interviewing farmers in the Hudson Valley, not that far from where I live, who are throwing off six-figure incomes off of a 10-acre plot. And that was because they found ways to go direct and because they found ways to lightly process it. There was a woman who inherited a potato farm from her grandfather, a marginal farm at best. She looked at the potatoes, she looked into her screens and go, what could I do with this? So what did she do? She got a distilling license and she's now making artisanal vodka out of her potatoes and selling them at the farmer's market for significant amounts of money. Is she doing just fine? The answer is she is. I think for those of us, whether it's in the commercial world, the advertising world, is understanding that role of what is global and what is local. I can remember going to Japanese super supermarkets where in the produce section, they had pictures of the farmer and the field that those tomatoes or potatoes or kumquats were born in. That global versus local is something that is going to be with us. And it is in a way a very positive change because we need to find ways to engineer cost out of our supply chain and to get things to us that are healthier and fresher. The final issue here is one that I've worked on, again, all over the world, but we as a species passed over a very magic moment in the late 1990s, where up until that point, the overwhelming majority of global wealth was in the hands of an aristocracy. If you think about Selfridges and Harrods, the roots of those companies were based on selling to people who were royalty, dukes, serfs, whatever. Today, if I look at the 20 wealthiest people across the globe, 19 out of those 20 earn their money in the course of their own lifetimes. If I go to the cosmetics counter at Selfridges, peaches and cream doesn't rule anymore. There is a wide array of skin tones. But part of what is interesting and challenging for our world, particularly those of you at Ogilvy, is that one of the challenges that we face is that often in order to sell, we have to first educate. Why does this t-shirt sold at uh, Primark cost three euro and this t-shirt sold at Harrods cost 20 euro? Some of it is the quality of the cotton, some of it is the feel, some of it is the construction. But part of what that process of educating is one that makes our challenge at a nudge stock and moving into the advertising future both poignant but also interesting. It is a very interesting time for us as a species. I have three things that I believe in with messianic fervor. The first is that amenability and profitability walk hand in hand. 
we can feel good about what we do if we recognize that we are looking out after the best in our customers. Second, is that giving good store or giving good web is looking at the interrelationship between what we sell and how we sell it and the operating culture. And for those of us in the broader world of commerce and those of you at Ogilvy, understanding that there is a relationship between marketing and operations, store design, visual merchant, merchant merchandising, and all of those things need to be strung together. And finally, I believe in rubber-soled shoes. Rubber-soled shoes, what are you talking about, Tom? Part of what my message is here is that all of us have gotten much too comfortable staring at our screens and thinking sitting down. I am reminded having served on the board of multiple Israeli technology companies that one of the lines that they've used often is that wars are won when generals get to the front. You know, one of the ironies of our retail and advertising culture is if I walked into the Ogilvy office in London and I found the desk farthest away from the front door, that's probably where the person in charge sat. I think it is very important for us to get to the front lines. It's very important for us to put those rubber sole shoes on and go look at the parking lot go look at the distribution center and get comfortable with what's going on where our products and our customers are meeting. Thank you for listening to me. Just one favor, if you want to keep Nudge Stock free, click the like button because the algorithm likes it and click the subscribe button too. The algorithm likes that and unlike the like button, it's actually useful because you'll get notified of future content from Nudge Stock whenever it becomes available.